Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Steve. My name is Arthur, and I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I gotta apologize a little bit. I didn't know there was gonna be readings at the beginning of this, so I brought down the one hour version instead of the 50 minute version. So I'm gonna to try to go along at a very brisk pace, and I'll forewarn anybody going out for coffee into the restrooms. You might miss a couple of decades in your absence. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to make this history presentation. It's going to be a timeline history of AA, uh, with extra emphasis on the history of the Big Book. AA co-founder Bill W. published a July 1953 Grapevine article titled A Fragment of History, describing the origin of the 12 steps. Bill identified the three main channels of inspiration for the 12 steps as Dr. William D. Silkworth, William James, and the Oxford Group. Dr. William D. Silkworth, who Bill fondly called the little doctor who loved drunks, is central to the big book chapter, The Doctor's Opinion. He was the medical director of Towns Hospital in 1934 when Bill W. sobered up there after four admissions. We'll get to Dr. Silkworth's specific influence on the steps and the big book in just a few slides. Harvard professor William James presented the Gifford Lecture Series on Natural Religion in 1901 at the University of Aberdeen in Edinburgh, Scotland. His lectures were published in 1902 in a critically acclaimed book titled The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature. Thirty-two years after its publication, a copy of the book was given to Bill W. during his last stay in Towns Hospital. It strongly influenced Bill and early AA members and is mentioned in the big book. James is mentioned twice in the big book by name. He is also called the founding father of American psychology. Lutheran minister Frank Bookman attended the Keswick Convention of Evangelicals in England in 1908. He had a profound conversion experience, and he helped another attendee to go through the same experience. Returning to the United States, Bookman began working out principles he later applied on a global scale. His evangelical movement was then called the First Century Christian Fellowship, and in the 1920s it was renamed to the Oxford Group, and in 1938 renamed again to Moral Rearmament, or MRA. In 2001, MRA was renamed to Initiatives of Change, but today it bears virtually no similarity to its early roots. Core Oxford Group principles consisted primarily of the four absolutes of absolute honesty, unselfishness, purity, and love. The Oxford Group gave AA the term sharing. They were also strong advocates of self-examination, admission of character defects, amends for harm done, and working in service with others. In early 1918, Sam Shoemaker met Frank Bookman in Beijing, China, and he too had a spiritual conversion experience and became a devoted member of Bookman's movement. In 1925, Shoemaker became rector of the Calvary Episcopal Church in New York City, and he assumed a leadership role in the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group's United States headquarters were set up at Calvary House, a building immediately next to the church. One more accomplishment of Shoemaker was the Calvary Rescue Mission. Bill W. wrote a January 1963 Grapevine article regarding his exchange of letters with Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. Bill informed Dr. Jung that his past treatment of an alcoholic patient in the early 1930s was, quote, the first in the chain of events that led to the founding of AA. The alcoholic patient was Roland H., and he was treated by Dr. Jung in Zurich, Switzerland, in either the mid to late 20s or early 1930s. And after returning to drinking, Roland was told by Dr. Jung that there was no medical or psychological hope for an alcoholic of his type, that his only hope was a vital spiritual or religious experience. Roland found sobriety to become a prominent member of the Oxford Group and a vestryman of the Calvary Episcopal Church in New York City. He later moved to Bennington, Vermont. AA's Oxford Group seeds were sown in Akron, Ohio, four years before Bill W. sobered up. Russell Bud Firestone was the son of business tycoon Harvey S. Firestone, Sr., and in 1931, Bud was drinking a fifth or more of whiskey a day. 
James Newton, a Firestone executive and Oxford Group member, introduced Bud to Sam Shoemaker. Bud spiritually surrendered with Shoemaker, and he was released from his alcohol obsession, and he joined the Oxford Group. Harvey S. Firestone Sr., grateful for the help given to his son Bud, funded an Oxford Group conference at Akron's Mayflower Hotel in January 1933. Firestone and the Reverend Walter Tunks met Frank Bookman and his team at the train station. The event was widely publicized and attracted some notable names in AA history, such as Henrietta Cyberling, T. Henry and Clarice Williams, and Dr. Bob's wife, Anne, who later persuaded Dr. Bob to attend Oxford Group meetings as well. By the autumn of 1933, Bill W. was quite literally drinking himself to death. In desperation, his wife Lois turned to their brother-in-law, Dr. Leonard B. Strong, for help, and he arranged and paid for Bill's first admission to Towns Hospital. Dr. Strong was married to Bill's sister, Dorothy. In July 1934, Ebby T. was approached in Manchester, Vermont, by two old drinking friends and now sober Oxford Group members. They were Sebra G. and Chef C., and they informed Ebby of the Oxford Group, but he was not quite ready yet to give up drinking. Sebra and Shep later vacationed at Roland H.'s house in Bennington, Vermont, and learned that Ebby was facing criminal charges and commitment to an asylum because of his drinking. Roland and Sebra attended Ebby's trial, and they persuaded the judge, who just happened to be Sebra's father, to parole Ebby to their custody. <laughs> While in Vermont, Roland introduced Ebby to the Oxford Group and later took him to the Calvary Rescue Mission in New York City. In late November, Ebby, a boyhood friend of Bill and Lois, heard about Bill's drinking problem, and he phoned Bill's wife, Lois, who invited him over for dinner. Ebby visited Bill, and he shared his recovery experience in the Oxford Group, which is described in the big book chapter, Bill's Story. Lotus, Lois later recalled that Ebby visited several times, once staying for dinner. Bill W. had two more admissions to Towns Hospital in July and September 1934. Following Ebby's visits, Bill entered Towns Hospital for the fourth time on December 11, 1934, and that's Bill's sobriety date. Bill later fell into a deep depression, and he had a profound spiritual experience that he later jokingly called his hot flash experience. Fearing that he had gone crazy, he summoned Dr. Silkworth, who told Bill to hang on to what he had experienced because it seemed so much better than what he came into the hospital with. During his hospital stay, Bill read William James's book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, and he found it deeply inspiring. It revealed three key points for recovery. First, the need for a complete defeat in a vital area of life, or what we today call hitting bottom. The second was the admission of defeat, or what we today call acceptance. And the third was an appeal to a higher power for help, or what we today call surrender. These spiritual principles later became the basis for steps one, two, and three. After Bill left the hospital, he and his wife Lois went to Oxford Group meetings at Calvary House. Bill worked with alcoholics at the Calvary Rescue Mission in Towns Hospital, emphasizing his hot flash experience. Alcoholic Oxford Group members also began meeting at his home on Clinton Street in Brooklyn. In March 1935, Henrietta Cyberling arranged a weekly Oxford Group meeting at the home of T. Henry and Clarice Williams. Its purpose was to help Dr. Bob stop drinking. But Dr. Bob could not stop, no matter how hard or how much he tried. After a few months at having no success in sobering up other alcoholics, Bill W. came very close to giving up on his efforts. However, his wife Lois reminded him that he was staying sober because of his working with others. In April 1935, Bill had a talk with Dr. Silkworth, who advised him to stop preaching about his hot flash experience and hit the alcoholics hard with the medical view on alcoholism. Silkworth advised Bill to break down the strong egos of alcoholics by telling them about the obsession that condemned them to drink and the allergy that condemned them to go mad or die it would then be so much easier to get them to accept the spiritual solution. Bill returned to Wall Street, and he was hired to lead a proxy fight for control of the National Rubber Machinery Company in Akron, Ohio. Bill went to Akron in May 1935, but the proxy fight was quickly lost. In poor spirits and tempted to enter the hotel bar, Bill realized he needed another alcoholic. He phoned clergy members listed on the hotel lobby directory, and he reached the Reverend Walter Tunks. 
Bill was put in touch with Henrietta Cyberling, and after meeting Bill at her home, she viewed his arrival as the answer to her prayers for Dr. Bob, and she called Dr. Bob's wife, Anne, to arrange a dinner the next day. On Mother's Day, May 12, 1935, Bill W., age 39, met Dr. Bob, who was age 55, at Henrietta Cyberling's gatehouse. Dr. Bob was so badly hungover that he couldn't eat dinner, and he planned to stay for only 15 minutes. Privately, Bill told Dr. Bob of his alcoholism experience in the manner suggested by Dr. Silkworth. Dr. Bob then opened up, and he and Bill talked until after 11 p.m. Dr. Bob's planned 15 minutes turned into six hours. Bill moved to Dr. Bob's house in early June, and they all went to Oxford group meetings at the home of T. Henry and Clarence Williams. In his big book story, Dr. Bob briefly describes his three-day binge at an AMA convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Upon his return to Akron, Bill W. helped him through a three-day sobering up period to get ready for a scheduled surgery. Dr. Bob had his last drink on the day of the surgery and gives the date as June 10, 1935. AA also marks this date as the beginning of the AA Fellowship. The books AA Comes of Age, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, and Pass It On all erroneously state that the AMA convention began the first week in June 1935. The AMA archives has long ago confirmed that the convention began in the second week of June 1935 on June 10th. Allowing for three-plus days of binging and blacking out, followed by three days of sobering up, Dr. Bob's sober date appears to actually be June 17th, not June 10th. In late June, Dr. Bob and Bill W. visited Bill D. at the City Hospital of Akron. Bill D., who would become AA number three, was a prominent attorney and had been hospitalized eight times in 1935 for his drinking. On July 4th, he checked out of the hospital never to drink again. Akron's group number one, which is AA's first group, marks its beginning as the date that Bill D. left the hospital. Bill W. left Akron and returned to New York City in August 1935. Bill focused his efforts on getting the New York group established, and they met at Bill's home on Clinton Street, and it also became a halfway house of sorts. Ebby T. came to live there in November. In late 1935, Hank P., whose big book story is The Unbeliever, and Fitz M., whose big book story is Our Southern Friend, sobered up at Towns Hospital with Bill's help. Hank and Fitz joined with Bill, and, and in the following years, Hank started AA in New Jersey and also had a major role in the development of the big book. Fitz M. started AA in Washington, D.C., and he helped start AA in Baltimore, Maryland. In April 1937, Ebby T. got drunk after two and a half years' sobriety, and it began an on-again, off-again pattern of drinking and sobriety that would stay with Ebby. In their early years, the Akron and New York groups were affiliated with the Oxford group. It was helpful at first, but over time it created problems. In August 1937, Bill W. and Lois stopped attending Oxford group meetings, and the New York AA separated from the Oxford group. And this was the beginning of AA separating itself from outside affiliation, and it set the groundwork for what would later become Tradition 6. The Akron group remained affiliated with the Oxford group for two more years. Dr. Bob and Bill W. met again in Akron in late 1937. There were two groups then and about 40 sober members, and more than half of them were sober for over a year. It was a remarkable success since every one of the sober members had previously been considered hopeless and beyond any help at all. Bill had some grandiose ideas for a chain of AA hospitals, paid missionaries, and a book of experience to carry the message to distant places. Dr. Bob liked the book idea, but not the hospitals and paid missionaries. In a meeting at T. Henry Williams' home, Bill's ideas narrowly passed by a single vote among the Akron members. The New York group was more enthusiastic. And this historic milestone marked the decision to write the big book. The book project's first challenge was financing, and it was no simple matter. The country was still in the grips of the Great Economic Depression, and the prospects of World War II were looming large overseas. Early efforts to raise funds were not successful. Bill W.'s brother-in-law, Dr. Leonard B. Strong, arranged a meeting in December 1937 with Willard S. Richardson, an ordained minister and the manager of John D. Rockefeller's philanthropies. A second meeting took place in January 1938. In February 1938, Willard Richardson asked Frank Amos to visit Akron, Ohio, and make a report on the small fellowship of alcoholics. 
His report was very detailed and exceptionally favorable. Richardson sent Amos' report to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., urging a donation of $5,000 a year for one or possibly two years, and that would be the equivalent of $76,000 a year in today's dollars. On March 17, 1938, Rockefeller replied that it was contrary to the policy of his philanthropies to fully fund a charitable enterprise unless it was decided to carry it indefinitely. Rockefeller declined to make a donation for the second year, but he provided $5,000 to be held in the fund in the Riverside Church Treasury. Much of the fund was used to immediately assist Dr. Bob by paying off the mortgage to his home. The remainder was used to provide Bill and Dr. Bob with $120 a month, and that would be the equivalent of $1,800 a month today, so that they could continue to dedicate themselves full-time to the fellowship. The writing of the big book began in April 1938 at the business office of New York member Hank P. at Honors Dealers, 17 William Street, Newark, New Jersey. Bill W. was the primary author of the big book and 12 steps, but others did make major contributions, and that's the way Bill wanted it to be. Bill wrote draft outlines on legal pads, and he dictated the expanded text to Ruth Hawk, who was then the Honors Dealers secretary. Each week, he would read drafts to those who met at his home, and edited copies were sent to Dr. Bob for further review and editing by the Akron members. As they worked their way through the chapters, the New York and Akron members also wrote the personal stories to be included in the book. In the spring of 1938, Bill wrote to Dr. Bob that he had drafted the chapters, There is a Solution, in Bill's story. Dr. Bob's wife, Anne, was invited to write the chapter portraying the wife of an alcoholic, but she declined. As it turned out, the chapter to wives was written by Bill, much to the dismay of his wife, Lois. <laughs> Bill informed Dr. Bob that nearly everyone in New York favored the title Alcoholics Anonymous, and this was almost a year prior to the book's publication. On July 18, 1938, Dr. Esther L. Richards wrote a very favorable letter to Bill W. regarding a two-chapter book prospectus sent to her for review. She, su she suggested getting a, quote, number one physician in the alcoholism field to write an introduction. Shortly after, Dr. William D. Silkworth wrote a July 27, 1938 letter of support for use in fundraising for the book, and it was incorporated into the chapter, The Doctor's Opinion, together with extracts from a paper that he wrote that was published in the Lancet Medical Journal in July 1939. Dr. Silkworth's name was not added to the doctor's opinion until publication of the second edition in 1955. On August 5, 1938, the Alcoholic Foundation was formed as a charitable trust to provide safekeeping of funds. The idea for its creation came from Willard S. Richardson. The trust indenture documents specified that non-alcoholic trustees were to make up a majority of the boards. The terms Class A and Class B trustees were used to make a distinction between the non-alcoholic and alcoholic board members. The foundation had a tiny one-room borrowed office with one borrowed non-alcoholic secretary by the name of Ruth Hock. The foundation and office would eventually come to be known as the General Service Board and the General Service Office, and Ruth Hock would later become AA's first national secretary. In September 1938, board trustee Frank Amos arranged a meeting between Bill W. and Eugene Xman, the religious editor of Harper Brothers Publishers. Xman offered Bill a $1,500 advance, and that would be the equivalent of $23,000 today, on the rights to the book. The Alcoholic Foundation Board urged acceptance of the offer, but Bill wanted ownership of the book to stay within the fellowship. Based on a recommendation from Eugene Xman, Hank P., persuaded Bill to form Works Publishing Company and sell stock at $25 par value, and that would be the equivalent of $380 a share today. 600 shares were issued, and Hank and Bill received 200 shares each, and 200 shares were sold to others. The newly formed Works Publishing Company would later come to be known as AA World Services, or AAWS. Prior to publication of the big book, there were two groups in Akron and New York. And the recovery program consisted of six steps passed on to new members by word of mouth. The lack of any written material resulted in widely varying versions depending upon who was doing the passing on. 
Different versions of the six steps can be found in the books, AA Comes of Age, Pass It On, and a July 1953 grapevine article by Bill W. titled A Fragment of History, which can be found in the book The Language of the Heart. The big book pioneer story, He Sold Himself Short, also contains a version of the six steps recorded by Earl T., founder of AA in Chicago. Dr. Bob was Earl's sponsor, and this version reflects a more orthodox Oxford group influence that prevailed in the Midwest. It should be noted, however, that the Oxford group did not have anything that they called or considered to be steps. It was only the alcoholics in New York and Akron, or it was then called the Alcoholic Squad, that exclusively had and practiced steps as their spiritual program of recovery. In his July 1953 Grapevine article, Bill W. Oh, no, I think I want. Bill W. wrote, Though these principles were advocated according to the whim or liking of each of us, and though in Akron and Cleveland they still stuck by the Oxford group absolutes of honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, uh, this was the gist of our message to incoming alcoholics up to 1939 when our present 12 steps were put to paper. The 12 steps were actually first put to paper in December 1938 at Bill's home at 182 Clinton Street in Brooklyn, New York. An approximate reconstruction of the original draft is in the book Pass It On, and, and I think it's shown on the screen. Uh, Bill claimed it took him about 30 minutes to do it. Words that were changed are highlighted in red. Much often heated debate on the wording of the new 12 steps continued right up to the publication of the big book. In a May 1955 grapevine article titled How AA World Services Grew, Bill W. described the book writing project as one where fierce arguments over the draft dominated the small fellowship's activities for months on end and that over time he became much more of an umpire than an author. 400 mimeograph manuscript copies were sent out for review and comments in January 1939. New York member Jim B. suggested the phrases, God as we understood him and power greater than ourselves be added to the steps and basic text. Bill W. wrote in his July 1953 grapevine article, quote, those expressions as we so well know today prove lifesavers for many an alcoholic. Jim B., whose big book story is The Vicious Cycle, started AA in Philadelphia and helped start AA in Baltimore, Maryland. The manuscript copies sent out for review were returned by March 39, 1939 and produced very few changes. However, a major change did occur when a Montclair, New Jersey psychiatrist, Dr. Howard, suggested toning down the use of you must to we ought or we should. Tom Muzell, a friend of Hank P. and an editor at Collier's and New York University faculty member, edited the manuscript and reduced it to around 400 pages. The cuts mainly came from the personal stories. After the editing, Bill W., Hank P., Ruth Hawk, and Darky S. of Cleveland drove to Cornwall, New York to deliver the heavily marked up manuscript to the Cornwall Press. The marked up manuscript contained hundreds of accumulated editing changes. The manager of Cornwall Press almost sent them back to type up a clean copy. Hank P. convinced the manager to accept the manuscript on condition that they would correct galley proofs as they came off the press. They checked into a hotel and spent the next several days proofreading galleys. The two markup manuscript pages shown are the beginnings of Chapter 5, How It Works, and many pages had handwritten notations from the very top to the bottom. In April 1939, 4,730 copies of the first edition of Alcoholics Anonymous were published, at $3.50 a copy, and that would be the equivalent to $54 a copy today. It was a very expensive book for its time. The printer, Edward Blackwell of the Cornwall Press, was told to use the thickest paper in his shop. The large, bulky volume became known as the Big Book, and the name has stuck ever since. In AA Comes of Age, Bill W. wrote that the idea behind the thick, large paper was to, quote, convince the alcoholic that he was getting his money's worth. The book had eight Roman and 400 Arabic numbered pages. The doctor's opinion started as page one and the basic text ended at page 179, not 164. The forward to the first edition contains many of the key principles that later shaped the traditions and the AA preamble. 
The brightly colored dust jacket on the left is called the circus color dust jacket. It was designed by Ray C., who also designed an Art Deco style shown on the right that was never used. Ray C.'s big book story is an artist concept. He began it with a quotation that he attributed to Herbert Spencer, which said, There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is content prior to investigation. Ray C.'s story was not included in the second edition big book. The quotation was added to Appendix 2, Spiritual Experience, in the fourth printing of the second edition in 1960. The attribution of the quote to Spencer is an error. It should be attributed to an English clergyman, author, and college lecturer by the name of William Paley, who lived from 1743 to 1805. Herbert Spencer, who lived from 1820 to 1903, was a great rival of his fellow Englishman, Charles Darwin, who is credited with the theory of evolution. However, it was Spencer, not Darwin, who popularized the term evolution, and he coined the term survival of the fittest. But Spencer did not author the quotation attributed to him in the big book. On May 10, 1939, the Cleveland members, led by pioneer member Clarence S., whose big book story is Home Brewmeister, announced that they would meet separately from Akron. Their first meeting was at the home of Abby G., whose big book story is he thought he could drink like a gentleman. After almost four years, this was AA's third group. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, public relations had the most dramatic impact on AA growth. A September 1939 Liberty Magazine article titled Alcoholics and God by Morris Markey caused many inquiries to be made to the New York office. In October 1939, the Cleveland Plain Dealer carried a series of editorials by Elric B. Davis. The result was spectacular and the Cleveland group was flooded with appeals for help. Cleveland membership surged from 20 to several hundred. Newcomers with just a few days of sobriety were assigned to make 12-step calls. The story of AA in Texas began in Cleveland in late 1939. A newspaperman, Larry J., age 40, all of 100 pounds, was found in freezing winter weather, blind drunk with no coat, a lung collapse from tuberculosis, and near death. Larry slowly recovered at a Cleveland hospital from DTs, malnutrition, and exposure. Cleveland AA members visited him regularly and took care of him. Physicians told Larry that because of his tuberculosis, he would be healthier in a warm climate. Larry, who had never attended an AA meeting, boarded a train to live and work in Houston with nothing more than a big book in hand. He had a spiritual awakening on the train while reading it. Dorothy S. of Cleveland wrote to AA's National Secretary, Ruth Hawk, on January 19, 1940, describing Larry as a brilliant newspaperman and completely down and out, owing to John Barleycorn. She asked Ruth to provide help to Larry in starting a group in Houston. Upon arriving in Houston, Larry J. sought out Alan C. Bartlett, the editor of the Houston Press. At first, Bartlett refused to see him since Larry's reputation as an alcoholic newspaperman had preceded him. Bartlett was persuaded to give Larry five minutes of his time as long as Larry promised not to ask him for a job. Uh, five minutes stretched into two hours, and Larry persuaded Bartlett to run a series of articles on AA, which he wrote with an anonymous byline. The articles were extremely well written, and they generated much favorable publicity for AA. Shortly after the articles were published, Larry was joined by Roy Y. and later Ed H. The articles... Uh, also attracted the first Texas woman AA member, Benita C., who later married Larry J. This began the first AA group in Texas. Their first meeting was on March 15, 1940, at the Houston YMCA. They met on Tuesdays with as many as 25 attending, but often it was a different 25 every meeting. The Houston Press articles led many to inquire about AA, and Alan C. Bartlett was so impressed with the articles that he hired Larry J. as an editorial writer. However, among all this joy, there was also later to be sorrow. As a fair number of AA pioneers did, Larry J. later returned to drinking in 1943, and it led to his death in 1944. On February 8, 1940, John D. Rockefeller Jr. held a dinner for AA at the Union League Club in New York City. Nelson Rockefeller hosted in the absence of his ill father. 
It produced much favorable national publicity and raised $2,200, or the equivalent of $33,000 today, from the attendees. And almost half of that came from Rockefeller. Rockefeller and several dinner guests continued to contribute to AA up to 1945 when they were asked uh, to stop. In March 1940, the Alcoholic Foundation office moved from 17 William Street, Newark, New Jersey, to 30 Vesey Street in New York City. Ruth Hopp became AA's first national secretary. Most of the draft yellow pages and manuscript drafts of the big book were discarded before the move. The following month, Hank P., who had objected violently to the move, got drunk after four years of sobriety. In May 1940, Works Publishing Company was legally incorporated as the publishing arm of the Alcoholic Foundation. Bill W. gave up his stock with a stipulation that Dr. Bob and Ann would receive 10% royalties on the big book for life. Hank P. was persuaded to give his shares as well. Hank is credited in a number of sources, including the book Pass It On, with writing the big book chapter 10 to employers. Ruth Hopp later wrote, quote, if it wasn't for Bill W., the big book would never have been written, and if it wasn't for Hank P., it would never have been published. A publication called the AA Bulletin was first mailed to, to groups by the New York office on November 14, 1940. It was intended to inform groups of important events. The bulletin listed a number of cities that were categorized according to the color of stars or pins you used to show them on a map in the office. There were four Green Star cities described as having, quote, isolated members who had recovered from the Big Book alone or through brief contact with established centers. There were five Red Star cities who were listed and described as having several AA members where meetings were in a so-called get-together stage. And there were 22 White Star cities listed and described as well-established where weekly meetings were held. Houston was among these 22 cities, the only Texas city listed. At almost five and a half years after its founding, AA had been brought to a total of 31 cities in the United States. On January 14, 1941, Ruth Hawk sent out AA Bulletin No. 2, noting that since the November 1940 Bulletin, AA was beginning in five more cities and there was some activity in Vancouver, Canada. The Bulletin also had a flash lead item that the Saturday Evening Post would be publishing an article on AA by Jack Alexander. The bulletin stated that there would likely be numerous inquiries in response to the article and that members and groups should, quote, stand by for active duty. The Saturday Evening Post article by Jack Alexander was published on March 1, 1941, and went out to a readership of over 3 million. Its impact on AA growth was profound and it was AA's most notable public relations blessing. During 1941, AA membership surged from 2,000 to over 8,000, and reprints of the article became a favorite pamphlet and is still reprinted to this day. Over 6,000 inquiries were sent to the New York office during 1941 because of the Post article. The New York office asked the groups for donations of $1, or the equivalent of $14 today, per member per year for support for extra staff to respond to all the appeals for help. And this began the practice of financing what is today called the General Service Office from group and member donations. In its early years, the New York office was called either the headquarters or central office or general office. It provided a central mail link to members attempting to start groups and helping them with growing pains. Over time, the accumulated letters sent in by the groups gave firm signals of a need for guidelines to help with group problems that occurred over and over. Basic ideas for the traditions came from these letters and the principles defined in the forward to the first edition big book. In March 1941, almost two years after the first printing, the wording of step 12 was changed in the second printing of the big book. The term spiritual experience was changed to spiritual awakening, and the term as the result of these steps was changed to as the result of those steps. An appendix titled Spiritual Experience was added. Many members thought that they had to have a sudden spectacular spiritual experience, similar to the one Bill W. describes in the chapter Bill's story. The appendix emphasized that most spiritual experiences developed slowly over time and were of the educational variety. AA National Secretary Rook Hawk sent out AA Bulletin No. 3 on June 30, 1941, announcing that the New York office had answered over 4,000 letters 
in the three months since the Saturday Evening Post article was published and that correspondence was being maintained with 116 cities. At the end of the bulletin, Ruth reported on the discovery of a prayer that we today call the Serenity Prayer. The office later printed the prayer on small cards, which they included in outgoing mail. For years within AA, it was called the AA Prayer instead of the Serenity Prayer. The prayer is attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr, whose version differs somewhat from the popular version. On December 31, 1941, the New York office distributed a four-page census of 146 known cities where AA had been established. The cities were classified again according to the color of, of pins or stars used to show them on a map in the New York office. Sixty-nine cities were classified as white star, having well-established groups. Forty-three cities were classified as red star, having several members who were just beginning, and 34 cities were listed as green star, having isolated members. Among the 69 well-established groups were Houston, Fort Worth, and Fort Worth. Houston had 85 members and Fort Worth had 12. Among the 43 Red Star cities of several members just beginning were Dallas, San Antonio, and finally among the 34 Green Star cities consisting of isolated AA members was the city of El Paso. Ruth Hawk left the New York office to marry on February 28, 1942, and Margaret Bobby B. took her place as national secretary. In 1942, A. Leroy Chipman asked John D. Rockefeller, Jr. and the 1940 dinner guest for a loan of $8,500. That would be the equivalent of $112,000 today. To buy back the remaining outstanding shares of work publishing stock, Rockefeller lent $4,000, his son Nelson $500, and the other dinner guest $4,000. By acquiring all the outstanding shares, it ensured that complete ownership of the big book would be held in trust for the entire AA fellowship. Communications to and from groups was greatly, greatly aided by the publication of two newsletters, the Cleveland Central Bulletin and the AA Grapevine. The Central Bulletin began publication in October 1942 and the Grapevine in June 1944. The Grapevine became AA's official magazine and played a critical role in the development of the traditions and general service conference. Both of these newsletters were important means to announce to groups and members when and where AA events were occurring. Both publications also contain much group history information. By the mid-1940s, the letters sent to the New York office by groups and members led to reliable conclusions on what practices worked well and those that didn't. Groups were also asked to send in all their membership rules, and it provided quite a shock. If all the membership rules were applied everywhere, it would be impossible for any alcoholic to join AA. In April 1945, Earl T., founder of AA in Chicago, suggested to Bill W. that the experiences sent in from group and member correspondents might be codified into a set of principles to offer tested solution to avoid future problems. Earl had a major role in the development of the traditions, both the long and the short form. He later served as a Class B trustee from 1951 to 54 and helped establish the General Service Conference. Earl is also the member described in the big book chapter, The Family Afterward, as getting drunk again after his wife nagged him about his smoking and drinking coffee. <laughs> the ending of World War II and demobilization marked a period of rapid growth in total AA membership as members of the armed forces returned to the United States in civilian life. Bill W. wrote in AA Comes of Age that the period from 1945 to 1950 was one of immense strain and test. The three main issues were money, anonymity, and what was to become of AA when its old-timers and founders were gone. Bill began his most intense and exhaustive work of reforming the traditions and creating a service structure to carry on after he and Dr. Bob were gone. The August 1945 grapevine carried Bill's first traditions essay titled Modesty, One Plank for Good Public Relations, and this began his five-year campaign for the traditions and the General Service Conference. In 1945, the Alcoholic Foundation Board wrote to John D. Rockefeller, Jr. and the 1940 dinner guests that their financial help was no longer needed. Big Book royalties could look after Dr. Bob and Bill, and group contributions could pay the office expenses. If these were insufficient, a reserve accumulated from literature sales could meet the deficit. Rockefeller and the dinner guests donated a total of $30,700. 
and that would be the equivalent of $345,000 today. The donations were viewed as loans and paid back out of big book income, and this finally led to the principle of being fully self-supporting, declining all further outside contributions, and later formed the basis for Tradition 7. In April 1946, the Grapevine was incorporated as the second publishing arm of the Alcoholic Foundation. The April Grapevine issue carried Bill W.'s essay titled 12 Suggested Points for AA Tradition. They later came to be called the Long Form of the Traditions. Bill started to feel out the board and members on the idea of representatives from various geographical areas coming together as an elected service conference. The board and Dr. Bob were not very enthusiastic about the idea. In June 1948, Dr. Bob was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He closed his office and he retired from practice so that he and his wife, Ann, could live their last days together quietly. In his last year, Dr. Bob fulfilled a lifelong dream of obtaining a convertible automobile, a Buick Roadmaster. Bill W. was spurred into greater urgency as Dr. Bob's illness progressed. He pressed harder for a general service conference to take the place of the AA founders and it resulted in hot debates and a serious rift developed between him and the Class B trustees over what they called Bill's sledgehammer tactics. In a July 1949 letter to the Reverend Sam Shoemaker, Bill W. wrote, quote, So far as I am concerned, and Dr. Smith too, the Oxford group seated AA. It was our spiritual wellspring at the beginning. Bill later expressed regret that he did not write to Frank Bookman as well. In AA Comes of Age, Bill W. wrote, quote, Early AA got its ideas of self-examination, acknowledgement of character defects, restitution for harm done, and working with others straight from the Oxford groups and directly from Sam Shoemaker, their former leader in America, and from nowhere else. As plans for the first international convention in Cleveland were underway, Earl T. of Chicago suggested to Bill W. that the 12 suggested points for AA tradition would benefit from revision and shortening. Bill, with Earl's help, developed the short form of the traditions, which were first published in the centerfold of the November 1949 grapevine. When the 12 and 12 was published in 1953, two wording changes were made to the 1949 version. The term primary spiritual aim in Tradition 6 was changed to the term primary purpose and the term principles above personalities in Tradition 12 was changed to principles before personalities. On Friday, July 28, 1950, AA's first international convention opened in Cleveland with approximately 3,000 people in attendance. Registration was $1.50 per person, and that would be the equivalent of $13 today. Bill W. chronicled the proceedings in a September 1950 grapevine article titled We Come of Age which can be found in the book, The Language of the Heart. And this was the only international convention attended by Dr. Bob, who was very determined to be there despite the progression of his terminal cancer. The program of the Cleveland International consisted of a series of meetings held from Friday through Sunday at various hotels. The Cleveland Auditorium Music Hall was reserved for Saturday afternoon to offer the traditions for approval. Contrary to popular belief, the short form of the traditions was not approved at the 1950 convention. What was approved by the attendees was quite different than both the long and short forms of the traditions as we know today. Following talks on the traditions by six members, Bill W. was asked to sum up the traditions for the attendees. He did so by paraphrasing a variation of the traditions shown in the slide and which can be found in the book, The Language of the Heart. Notably missing from what Bill recited were the principles embodied in Tradition 10 regarding outside issues and public controversy. Nevertheless, the traditions as recited by Bill were approved unanimously. On July 30, 1950, a gravely ill Dr. Bob made a brief appearance for what would be his last talk. After the convention, Bill W. visited Dr. Bob in Akron, Ohio for their last visit together. Bill informed Dr. Bob that the board would soon give its consent to a multi-year trial period for the General Service Conference. Dr. Bob gave Bill his endorsement as well. Dr. Robert Holbrook Smith, age 70, co-founder of AA and 15 years sober, died on November 16, 1950 at City Hospital in Akron, Ohio. In his 15 years of sobriety, Dr. Bob helped more than 5,000 alcoholics, and he never took any fee for his professional services. In his eulogy, 
Bill W. described Dr. Bob as, quote, the prince of the 12-steppers. Class A board trustees Leonard Harrison and Bernard B. Smith resolved a five-year conflict between Bill W. and the board on having a general service conference. Smith, who Bill would later call the architect of the service structure, chaired a trustees committee that recommended that conferences be held on an experimental basis from 1951 to 54, and that in 1955 it would be evaluated and a final decision made. On April 20, 1951, 37 United States and Canadian delegates, half the planned number, convened at the Commodore Hotel in New York City as the first panel of the General Service Conference. The conference unanimously approved several advisory actions, among them that AA literature should be conference approved. Panel 1 delegates to, from Texas were Olin L. from Dallas and Icky S. from Houston. Icky later moved to Dallas, and he became the first Class B trustee from Texas in 1955. On April 23, 1952, Panel 2, consisting of 38 additional delegates, joined with Panel 1 for the first conference of all delegates attending. Texas Panel 2 delegates were Robert S. from Lubbock and Roy G. from Austin. Based on the 1951 advisory action on conference-approved literature, the board formed a trustees committee to recommend literature items that should be retained and future literature items that would be needed. Bill W. also reported on his literature projects. One of them involved the updating of the story section of the big book to provide a more truly representative cross-section of AA recovery stories. The board's proposals and Bill's projects were unanimously approved. There's not a specific advisory actions, but by approving existing literature to be retained, the conference retroactively approved the big book and the long form of the traditions. Board Chairman Bernard B. Smith reported to the 1953 conference that the corporate name of Works Publishing had been changed to Alcoholics Anonymous Publishing. The first conference approved book to be distributed under the new publishing name was The Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions, and it contains the final wording of the short form of the traditions as we know today. In 1953, a New York member collaborated with Panel 1 Delegate Olin L. of Dallas to take Ebby T. to Texas for treatment at a clinic run by Searcy W. After some early troubles, Ebby found sobriety in Texas, and he stayed for eight years. And this was Ebby's longest period of sobriety. In 1954, Ralph J. and his wife Mary Lee invited Ebby for a lengthy stay at their sheep ranch near Arizona. Panel 1 Delegates Olin L. and Icky S. virtually adopted Ebby, and Searcy W. Became, became Ebby's Texas sponsor. The 1955 General Service Conference convened in St. Louis, Missouri on June 26th to 29th and again on July 3rd. Seventy-five delegates unanimously recommended adoption of a permanent conference charter subject to the approval of the Second International Convention that would convene in St. Louis on July 1st. The final conference session was scheduled to be held on the afternoon of July 3rd in conjunction with the International Convention. A's 20th anniversary and Second International Convention was held in St. Louis's Keele Auditorium from July 1st to 3rd, 1955. Estimated attendance was 3,800, and its theme was coming of age. The 2 p.m. Sunday afternoon meeting was designated as, quote, the last session of the General Service Conference. It is the only time in the history of the conference that it has been open to AA members. At the invitation of Chairman Bernard B. Smith, Bill W. made some introductory remarks, and he presented a resolution to the attendees, the heart of which read, be it therefore resolved that the General Service Conference of Alcoholics Anonymous should become, as at this date, July 3rd, 1955, the guardian of the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, the perpetuator of the world services of our society, the voice of the group conscience of our entire fellowship, and the sole successors to its co-founders, Dr. Bob and Bill. The resolution was unanimously approved. The second edition Big Book was introduced at the 1950. Five international convention at a retail price of $4.50, and that would be the equivalent of $35 today. It contained 30 new personal stories. Bill W. renumbered the pages of the second edition so that page one began with Bill's story instead of the doctor's opinion. It's not known why he did this, but there has been some, <laughs> there has been some very creative and entertaining speculation on that. 
The December 1955 grapevine carried a painting by volunteer illustrator Robert M. of a man on a bed being 12-stepped by two members. The painting's title originally was Came to Believe. And in 1973, when the book Came to Believe was published, grapevine editors changed the painting's name to The Man on the Bed to avoid confusion. It is probably the most popular image in AA today. In 1956, the wording of Step 12 changed again in the second printing of the second edition Big Book. The term as the result of those steps was restored to its original form as the result of these steps. AA's popular slogan plaques were first published in five grapevine issues from September to December 1956 and February 1957. Four slogans are from the big book. But for the grace of God is from the chapter, there is a solution. Easy does it, first things first, and live and let live are from the chapter, the family afterward. The slogan, think, 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 is a bit of a mystery. Some say, some say it originated in Cleveland, Ohio in the mid-1940s. However, its actual source is unknown. The 1962 conference unanimously approved Bill W.'s manuscript to title 12 Concepts for World Service. With the publication of this book, all the spiritual principles of AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service were defined and explained in detail. On March 21, 1966, Ebby T. died of emphysema. Some members believe that he died drunk, and it's not true. He was two and a half years sober when he passed away. Bill W. loyally referred to Ebby as his sponsor throughout his life. The U.S. copyright for the first edition Big Book expired in April 1967 and was not renewed. It was not discovered until 1985 when it was also discovered that the copyright for the second edition had lapsed in 1983. It should be noted, however, that the Big Book copyright had expired only in the United States. It is still in force outside the United States under international treaty agreement. In July 1970, AA's 35th anniversary and 5th International Convention took place at Miami Beach, Florida. Bill W. appeared on Sunday morning for what would be his last public appearance. His health had steadily weakened due to the emphysema. He was confined to a wheelchair and required the administration of oxygen. On January 24, 1971, William Griffith Wilson, age 75, co-founder of AA, 36 years sober, died at the Miami Heart Institute in Miami Beach, Florida. The date was also Bill and Lois's 53rd wedding anniversary. Bill W. was the architect and author of AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service, and all the written works that explain them. And this was an amazing achievement because he had no training at all as a writer. In 1990, Life magazine named Bill W. as one of the 100 most important Americans of the 20th century. Similarly, in 1999, Time magazine named Bill W. as one of the 100 international heroes and icons of the 20th century. Three months after Bill W.'s death, the 1971 General Service Conference approved the short form of the 12 Concepts for World Service. The 1976 conference approved publication of the third edition Big Book. The conference also expanded the provisions of Article 3 of the Permanent Conference Charter so that any change to the steps, traditions, or warranties would require written approval of 75% of the registered AA groups known to general service officers around the world. This conference advisory action effectively makes any proposed change to the steps, traditions, and warranties a virtual impossibility, even so much as adding or removing a comma. Some members erroneously believe this restriction also applies to making changes to the basic text of the Big Book. It does not. In the remaining time, I have just about five more slides. I will try to sum up uh, the key role of the Big Book in AA history and why I believe it enjoys and deserves so much respect and admiration from the AA Fellowship. AA's historic 1955 International Convention in St. Louis introduced a new circle and triangle symbol that was prominently displayed on a large banner draping the back of the stage. In AA Comes of Age, Bill W. described the circle as representing the whole of AA. The triangle represented AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service. Each of AA's three legacies has a foundation of 12 spiritual principles. They are the 12 steps for the legacy of recovery, the 12 traditions for the legacy of unity, and the 12 concepts for the legacy of service. There is an old saying that hindsight is 2020, and history is hindsight, particularly in searching for cause and effect. The common root action that caused the written evolution of the three legacies of AA very likely took place in October 1937. 
It was a group conscience decision by the Akron and New York groups to permit the writing of a book of experience that later came to be fondly known in AA as the Big Book. The book's contents explain the 12 steps in AA's legacy of recovery. The forward to the first edition defines many of the key principles that were later absorbed into the 12 editions and AA's legacy of unity. And finally, the service structure that was needed to produce and distribute the book and manage the public relations and funds related to book sales provided much of the experience and organization that later helped shape the 12 concepts in AA's legacy of service. The origin and development of the big book is singularly unique. As AA's first piece of literature, every AA member at the time of its writing had an opportunity to individually and directly contribute to its wording, and they probably did. This is true of no other piece of AA literature. The big book has a remarkable history of carrying the message of recovery throughout the world in the 20th and 21st centuries. 300,000 copies of the first edition were distributed from 1939 to 1955, and 1,150,000 copies of the second edition were distributed from 1955 to 1976, and 19,550,000 copies of the third edition were distributed from 1976 to 2002. The major historical milestone for AA in the first decade of the 21st century was the 2001 conference approval and publication of the fourth edition Big Book. By 2007, Big Book distribution reached the 28 million mark and is now exceeding the 30 million mark, and that's just the English language version. The fourth edition introduced a new appendix containing the fourth short form of the 12 concepts for world service. The Big Book now contains all the spiritual principles of AA's three legacies of recovery, unity, and service. Contrary to popular belief, a number of wording changes have been made to the basic text over the years. The 2006 General Service Conference approved a change to the preface of the fourth edition so that it reads, therefore the first part of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left largely untouched in the course of revisions made for the second, third, and fourth division editions. The word largely was added to correct the erroneous impression that the basic text had not been changed over the prior editions. And I'm going to skip this. In 2003, the book Experience and Hope was published, and it contained 56 stories that were previously published in the first three editions and later replaced. I'm going to skip this because I'm behind. Uh, AA story began with a five month sober and still shaky stockbroker from New York, and he had his last drink, which was a beer, in the lobby of Towns Hospital in New York City in December 1934. While on a failed business trip to Akron, Ohio, he met an alcoholic surgeon who desperately wanted to stop drinking. And he had his last drink, which was also a beer, in front of Akron City Hospital in June 1935. It's probably safe to say that when AA's co-founders met, they had no idea at all of the fellowship of alcoholics that would evolve from their humble meeting and how that fellowship would go on to save the lives of millions of alcoholics worldwide over the next 75 years. Their legacies are today described as recovery, unity, and service. They are our gifts to freely receive, and it is our duty to freely give them away. It's been a remarkable journey down the road of happy destiny. And that concludes the presentation. I hope you found it both informative and enjoyable. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.